Good morning, Hessel Church family. Uh, been looking forward to spending this time together with you. I am excited about what I'm going to preach on today. But before I get into that, I just want to again uh, say to you, I hope that you are reading through Psalm 145 and are memorizing it, committing these verses to, to memory and allowing them to change your heart. I will give you a testimony myself. These verses have ministered to me during times of difficulty. I've uh, awakened in the night even and, and rehearsed these in my mind and they have been such a great encouragement to me. And so as your pastor and somebody who loves you, I wanna encourage you to continue to look into God's word and, and hide God's word in your heart. Uh, you are cherished people to me, but more importantly, you are a cherished people to the Lord and he wants you to know him better and better. So I wanna just take you on a little stroll down uh, memory lane as we go through the sermon series. I want to remind you where we've been over the last six weeks. This is our seventh week in our series. And I'm gonna put it up here on the screen to just kind of refresh your mind as to what we've been talking about when we've been talking about the character and the nature of God. So here we go. God is good. It all begins with Him. It is all about Him. He is the creator and king of everything that exists. There is no one and no thing above or beyond Him. Yet as God, He is knowable desiring a personal relationship with each of us. God is great and active from generation to generation. His word and creation reveal that He is awesome, good, and righteous. God is eternal in His existence and unchanging in His nature. He is both gracious to give more than we deserve and merciful to withhold what we do deserve. Even when we are unfaithful, God remains slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Because God is in complete control, every moment of every day, humanity enjoys the divine gift of God being good to all. This is our God. Because of His goodness and greatness, we must thank God, submit to God, and share Him with, uh, with others. We have learned some amazing things about God and it has inspired us and encouraged us as we've learned about the character, the nature, the attributes of God. And this week is no different because we're gonna to continue to press in. We have this series that we've, we've called Diving Deeper, Discovering the Riches of God. And we're gonna dive deeper here this morning as well. So this morning we begin with another question. And the first question we ask is, uh, what happens when I do not experience God in my everyday life? What happens when I don't discover the God that David is talking about? I mean, you may look at me this morning and go, Pastor Rich, I've been taking notes. I've been listening to all previous six weeks. I, I, I've studied the word. Maybe I've even committed this to memory. But if I'm honest, Rich, I am not experiencing the God that David is talking about in my everyday life. And so if we were to, to lower our masks this morning, and I'm not talking about our N95 masks, and I'm not talking about our COVID masks, but our emotional and spiritual masks, if we did that, we might say that maybe life is pretty hard right now that this is a dark season, a difficult, stressful time in our lives. Sure, David says God is good, but some of you are here this morning saying, where? Where is God? This is a season of difficulty and coldness and struggle. And if that's you this morning, <laughs> let me tell you, I am so grateful that you've come here. You have come to the right place this morning because on this verse that we're going to look at, David pivots. And instead of just talking about the goodness and the greatness of God and all the attributes of God, he pivots to talk about how we experience God when it, we don't feel him. When life is hard, when, when it's gray and dark and gloomy, 
And so I want to ask you to take your Bibles, open them up to Psalm 145, and we're going to look at just one verse this morning. We're going to look at Psalm 145, verse 14. It's going to be on the screen. Look at it here this morning. It says this, The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Let me, let me read that again. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. <laughs> Pretty simple verse. There's only 15 words in that verse. I counted them this morning. And, and I want you to know you might be thinking, if you've been in church for a while, what's the big deal? How can you talk for the next several minutes about one verse? I already know this stuff. This is old news. But I have to tell you, I've been praying that these 15 words encourage us all, us all this morning and change us all this morning. Because I, I've said it before, there's really only three kinds of people at Hessel Church. One group of people would be called those people who are going through a storm right now. And right now, life is incredibly hard. It's dark. It's pressing, the darkness may be even pressing in, there's no light at the end of the tunnel, and you're just having the hardest of hard times. And uh, if I were to talk with you alone and I'd say how you're doing, you might just break down right now with tears and say, I'm, I'm not doing well. And so one group of people in our church right now are, are the group of people who are in a storm. The second group of people would be people who are not currently in a storm, but you have come out of a storm, maybe recently, maybe a little bit further in the past, but if anybody asks you about storms, you say, yeah, I, I know what a storm looks like. I've, uh, I know what it's like. I got a diagnosis one time, or I went through a hard time with this relationship, and, or, or whatever it was, and I know, you ask me about storms, I know all about storms. And so you got the first group of people who are in the storm, second one who have been in the storm, maybe coming out of the storm or it's been a while, but there they are. And the third group of people that are here at Hessel listening in today is a group of people who are going to be in a storm one day, maybe soon. And of the three, this is probably the most ominous because you don't know when, you don't know where, you don't know how, you don't know who, you don't know what. You, you don't know, you just know, the Bible says that we're going to go through times of difficulty. So this morning, wherever you are in those three groups, let me tell you something, there is something for you to learn in these 15 verses. So the question we've been asking ourselves every week is, what do these verses tell us about God? And the first, there's going to be two points this morning. The first point is this, it tells us that God upholds. God upholds. Look at the verse there on the screen. The Lord, and that's Yahweh, the Lord upholds all who are falling. This word upholds means to lift up, to prop up, to support, to hold on to. The, the Lord is promising here to hold up, to supply what we need when we are, when we're falling. It's a promise that he makes. Now, I'm not going to ask you this morning to raise your hand right now, but I'm relatively certain that you as a believer at one time or another have, have felt like you are falling. You felt like you're a failure like you are not measuring up. You feel like you've missed it. You're not good enough. Now, before I get any further, I want to just talk about how do we, how do we find ourselves falling? Now, I was thinking about the analogy of when a person falls, what, what causes the fall? And the first, the first cause might be somebody pushes you. If you're walking along the edge of a cliff and all of a sudden somebody who's mean or whatever, they come and shove you and, and someone or something pushes you and you find yourself falling. There's some of you who are watching this morning who have experienced that. Maybe it was a spouse who betrayed you and they pushed you off and you're falling in a state of despair. 
you feel abandoned and you're just falling. Maybe it was a parent who, who betrayed you. Maybe it was someone and it just, it was like this being shoved off of a cliff. And some of you are falling due to no, nothing you've done wrong. Just life has happened. Someone pushed you, something pushed you. The, the second way that we might fall our, find ourselves falling is because we stumble. Maybe we got too close to the edge. Maybe we're walking through life and we're being tempted with something and we get a little closer to the edge and we fall, stumble into sin. And all of a sudden we're, we're just falling, free falling at this particular time in, in sin. Rebellion. And maybe this morning you, you say, yeah, that's me. I maybe even chose at that point to get close to the edge. And I feel like a failure and you're falling. The third kind of person that might find themselves falling is somebody who's weak. And it's not really one thing in particular, but the accumulation of stresses in life have started to, to pile up on top of you, weigh you down, and you find yourself just falling. I can't do this anymore. It's no one thing. It's just a whole bunch of things. The death of somebody you love, the pressures of COVID, raising kids, teaching kids on all these things and you feel just man just accumulation of pressures on you regardless of how you find yourself falling this morning let me tell you something david is throwing you a lifeline and he wants you and me to know that it doesn't really matter how you find yourself falling the lord is the one who holds upholds those who are all those who are falling your marriage, falling apart, he's holding. Going through a time of depression and anxiety, he's holding. You've experienced great loss, he's holding. Whatever you and I are experiencing, he's holding on to you. Some of you say, you know, I, I feel like I'm just falling away from God. I, I hear all my friends going, you know, I get up in the morning, and I have my devotions, it's so good. And you go, I, I don't have. Have. I feel like a failure. I feel like I'm just falling away from the Lord. I don't measure up. And some of you today are feeling as if you're millions and millions of miles away from God and you just tuned in hoping to connect with Him. So here we go. Some of you say, okay, the Bible says, great. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down, but I don't feel like I'm being held. I, 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 I hear what you're saying to me, Rich, but I, I'm not feeling it. Great, God is awesome. We've learned that in this psalm. He's good. He's unchanging, all those things, but I don't feel it. Listen, church, this is so important. Before we go any further, if I base my faith upon emotion that would be crazy it would be dangerous as a follower of Jesus why because we must base our faith on fact not on feeling our emotions we're emotional beings right at nine o'clock in the morning how you feeling great 2 30 in the afternoon how you feeling not so we we can't base our faith upon emotions otherwise we're just a train wreck and following your, people say, well, just follow your heart. Let me tell you something, following your heart is a horrible idea. It, it doesn't work. Why? Because scripture tells us in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Listen, listen to me. This is what this verse is saying. You and I lie more, I lie more to myself you lie more to yourself than anybody in the rest of the world will ever lie to you. Our hearts will lie to us. They're constantly lying to us. It's called our flesh. It's constantly raging against us. So if you and I base our lives on, on emotion, we're in trouble. So here's a life application. It's on the screen. Here it is. I must allow my walk with God to be based upon what is true not upon what I feel. David, David is telling us the truth. 
Your God is faithful and true. He promised you. He is holding you right this moment. Some of us might go down and buy a major appliance. or Maybe you go buy a car and you have a salesman that's working with you. And they might, she or he might say to you, hey, this is a great car. You can trust me. You can trust me with this. This is a great car. Trust me. And how can we trust them? We don't know them. David says, let me tell you something. When God has made this promise that he is holding you, you can trust him. Why? Because God is, he am. God is unchanging. God is gracious and merciful. He is awesome in power and deeds. He keeps his promises all the time. We are in the capable hands of God. That's the truth. It doesn't matter what you're feeling this morning. I know you might not be feeling, but you need to know the truth. Bring truth into your, into your falling, into your emotional angst and pain that you're feeling right now. God has made us a promise. I will uphold you. You can bank on it. You don't have to hope this can happen. I place my life in the capable hands of a faithful, good, gracious God who's all powerful. Several years ago, maybe almost 10 years ago, I was meeting together with a group of men and we'd meet together every morning and we'd work out together and, and we'd pray and we'd, we'd noodle and meditate on different passages of scripture. And a couple of us were going through some very hard times. I was one of them and my good friend was another. And man, I'll tell you something. We were hurting. We were falling. Felt like we were out of control. That's what falling, when you're falling, you got no control. And in our Bible reading, we came across a couple of verses that we began to meditate on for a couple of months. I just talked to my friend about that very thing this morning. I called him, I said, do you remember? Oh, I'll never forget it. And it comes from Psalm 131. I want to share it with you. It says this. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. I'm going to leave that slide up there, but I want you to see what that means. What's that mean? There's some things in life that will not make sense. The abandonment, the betrayal, the things that have happened to in our lives. <clears throat> Somebody dying prematurely, it doesn't make sense. So he says this, I will not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But listen, I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. I want to leave that slide up there for a moment. I want you to just imagine in your mind, because you've seen it, a little toddler who's climbed up in his mom's arms. And he's just resting. All of his weight is on mom. He's not anxious, he's not hungry. He's not stressed. He is completely at peace. How, how can a, how can a child rest so peacefully? Because mom is trustworthy. She's loving. I want you to look at me for a second here. I want you to, to understand this. Our God says, I'm holding you. And he's inviting us to understand this truth about him. And he says, I want you to climb up in my arms like a little toddler would. And just relax. Take all the pressures, all the stress, all the... All the sadness, all the grief, and just peacefully relax. 
And you say, well, how can I do that? How, how, can I, how can I just let go and just rest like that? The same way a toddler does. One of the verses we, we learned in previous weeks is that our God, we, we learned this, is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and you remember this one? And abounding in steadfast love. I, I just want to personalize something with you right now. These last couple weeks for me have been extraordinarily stressful. Extraordinarily challenging. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm living about a 9. And I was brought back to this verse. That I too, like that image of a, of a toddler, need to go back and climb up in my father's arms and just say, God, I'm just going to rest. I'm not going to worry about things that are too marvelous for me. I don't understand everything. But I do understand this, that you are abounding in love for me. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, Rich, I don't really deserve that kind of love. Some of the reason, the reason I'm falling, I've gone off the rails. I've been sinning. I've, I've been a train wreck here. Let me tell you something about this God who's abounding in steadfast love. You and I don't deserve it, but he loves us anyway. Max Lucado says this, God loves you simply because he's chosen to do so. He loves you when you don't feel lovely. He loves you when no one else loves you. Others may abandon you, divorce you, and ignore you. But God will love you always, no matter what. In this series, we've been talking about the fact that when all of our problems are big, it's because we have a diminished view of God. But when we get a big, huge view of God, how in His greatness, all these other things start to diminish in size. Oh, I want to encourage you, man, this week, think about that child when stress has come and it feels dark and the world's closing in. Think about that child resting and choose to climb up in your father's lap to rest as well. So the, so the first thing that we've learned is that God upholds the second truth from this verse we learn is that God raises us up. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. This word raise means to encourage or, or helps. Who does God help? Those who are bowed down, those who are humble, those who will look to him Instead of trying to spin out, trying to do all the things themselves and to answer all the problems, and those who will stop, climb up in his lap and trust him, those are the ones he's going to raise up. I, I want to give you another life application here. Here it is. God is active in my adversity. God is active in my adversity. Here's what God does. God comes to all the people who are oppressed, depressed, abused, all the people who are in trouble, who are frustrated, who are, are anxious and lonely and feeling hopeless. He comes to them to help and to encourage us as we just humble ourselves before Him. I, I love this about God. He is active. He is engaged in our lives. He's not like sending us off into the day, go get him, tiger. There you go. He's not saying, hey, Rich, you go do Rich. Go do your, th your thing. This, I'm in the stands and I'm going to cheer for you. He doesn't do that. He is active in our lives and he is active in our adversities. And what is he up to? This is what he's up to. I want you to know this. In my life, in these last couple of weeks, as I'm feeling this level of stress, you know what he's up to? You know what he's up to in your life? I'll tell you. He's up to conforming you and me into the image of his son. There's a song that we sing here at Hessel, and I'm going to put the words up on the screen. It goes like this. By your spirit, I will rise from the ashes of defeat 
The resurrected king is resurrecting me. What's that mean? When I was a small boy, the resurrected king resurrected me once and for all by saving me. I was a kid and I, somebody told me that Jesus had died on the cross for my sin and I knew I was a sinner. And I placed my faith in him. I believed that Jesus was God, that he died on the cross and rose. And in that moment, once and for all, the resurrected king resurrected me. But let me tell you something else that's just as phenomenal. Every day thereafter, the resurrected king is resurrecting me again. Not for salvation, but he is doing a work in my life every single day. He resurrects, he gives me strength and encouragement. He helps me when I've fallen. He, he helps me through the challenges that are in my life. This resurrected king is active in your and my life. I want to give you a, a, an example of this. Many of you know the story, but I want us to focus on it. I, I, I hope it's an encouragement to you. You'll remember in, in Daniel chapter 3, there's these three fellows by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were young boys who were taken after a war, taken into slavery, and brought over to the, to the, the nation of Babylon. And at the head of this world empire of Babylon was this king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. He, he was all about himself. He was very full of himself. And these three guys were, were God followers. They followed the one and only God. So this king, Nebuchadnezzar, has this grand, grand idea. And he says, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create this golden 90-foot statue of me. See, I told you he was full of himself. And he says, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to build this great big gold statue. And I know every time I'm going to tell the band to play at different times. And whenever the band plays, everybody's going to bow down and worship me. They'll worship the idol. They're worshiping me. The statue, this is going to be awesome. And so he gets it all built. They, they put it out into, into, the, into the area where everybody can see this thing. And sure enough, he strikes up the band and the band is going to play. And it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're cooking, you got to stop. You got to go outside and you got you to bow down. If, if you're taking a nap, you got to get up. You got to go out there and bow down. And so the band starts to play. And as it plays, everybody bows down and worships the statue. Except three guys. You got it. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. And they don't bow down. So some of the guys who work for old King Nebuchadnezzar, they want to get in good with him. They're kind of kiss-ups. And so what they do is they notice that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are not bowing down. And so they go to the king and says, oh, my goodness, we got we to grab hold of these guys. First off, they go get Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, bring him, haul them, him in before the, them in before the king, and say, king, he's not doing it. He's not doing what you told him. They're total narcs, they're total tell, tattletales, they're just, you know, I, they're, they're, not, he's, they're not bowing down. They're not doing it. And the king's like, uh, apparently you guys don't get the rules. You got to do this. Everybody is going to bow down and worship the statue of me. And, and just so you don't, you'll miss anything. These are the rules. And if anybody doesn't do this now, we've got this really cool furnace and it's just filled with fire. That we, we're, What we're going to do is we're going to throw anybody that doesn't bow down into this fiery furnace and you'll be burned up. And so I'm sure, the king says to the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'm sure now that you understand the rules, that, that you're going to do this. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego goes, ah, uh, you know what? We don't want to wa waste the band's time. We don't want to, we don't want to waste your time, but because we'll, we're going to just tell you, we're not going to bow. I want you to see what they say in Daniel 3, verse 17 and 18. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. Look at the respect there. But even if he doesn't, we want to make clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Why? Because we worship, is what they're saying. 
We worship the God that David's talking about. Yahweh. We worship the God who is, before time, He created time. The God who is unchanging, the God who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. We worship Him, the awesome God that He is. We will not bow our knee to anyone else. Well, you can only imagine. Old King Nebuchadnezzar gets, becomes furious. He gets completely ticked off. And so he gets these got three guys, he has them bound he, with, uh, with straps and whatnot, hand and foot, ties these guys up, and he's so furious, he tells his, his, uh, the guys that are working for him to, to crank up the furnace seven times hotter than it's ever been, seven times hotter than normal. And the guys grab onto these, these three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they haul them up the steps. They, they're going to throw them in. And they get As the door of the furnace opens, the fire is so hot, it comes out and it actually consumes those people who are carrying up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> and, it, and they throw these guys in. They get thrown in there. Now, I want you to know something here. I know that this sounds like a fairy tale, but this is not a fairy tale. This is the Bible. This is true. And I want you to stop and imagine for a second. I I want you to imagine that you're Nebuchadnezzar. You don't believe in God. You don't believe there is a God. You think that these three guys who believe in God are just believing in fairy tales. They've been drinking the happy juice or something's going on because they're not very smart at all. And he's thinking, you know what? I'll throw these guys in. I'm going to wash my hands of it all. I'm going to go in and watch the game, have a little dinner and take a nap. I got it. This is, we're all done with this thing. I want you to see what happens. In verse 24, it goes on to say, but suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, wait, wait, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. Listen, church, I want you to understand, our God is active in our adversity. It it says that they're walking around, but if this, if I could have Rich Kundal version of scripture right here, it's going to say they're dancing around. They're joyfully celebrating the fact that God has delivered them. And who is this fourth guy? Oh, Bible scholars, we believe, we happen to believe that this is Jesus, the pre-born Jesus who always existed, pre-incarnate Jesus who appears and steps into the adversity with these three guys, steps into the fire. The Lord God upholds those who are falling and raises up those who are bowed down. And when they come out of the fire, guess what? They don't even smell like smoke. Man, when I sat next to a campfire for a couple minutes, man, all my clothes smell like, they come out, they don't smell like smoke. There's not a hair on their arms or a head that is singed, nothing. They come out perfectly whole and healthy. And of course, about this time, old Nebuchadnezzar, man, he is tripping out. He has no idea what's going on. He doesn't know what to expect. Then he basically says, what I'll have what they're having. I don't know what's going on. I, I don't know who they're worshiping, but I'm going to start to worship who they're worshiping. I want their God. Look what the verse, verse 29 says. He says, Nebuchadnezzar says, there is no other God who can rescue like this. Church, I am so challenged by this. This simple verse, what, what if people saw me walking around Dealing with the stresses of life. What if they saw you walking around through the stress and strain and darkness of life and they looked at you and they say, I want what they have, what they have. 
I want to worship because what they are experiencing peace in the midst of the flames and the fire. They're experiencing joy. I'm watching them go through this awful thing. They're falling. We can all see that, but I see them reading their Bible. I see them praying. I see them memorizing Psalm 145. I see them walking in joy and peace in spite of what's happened to them. First, they might look at you and me and they might say, yeah, they're walking through this adversity and they're leaning on God. They look like they're kind of crazy. But in time, they're going to see it's different. You're not grabbing alcohol to numb the pain. You're not looking for a relationship with some other person to deaden what you're feeling. You're trusting God. And He gives a peace that is not temporary, but is a permanent thing. That's our God. That is our God who walks with us through the adversities that we're feeling, that God shows up. And some of you are thinking, well, that's great. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God showed up for them. God doesn't show up for me. Let, let me just tell you something. You know, you know, yay, God, you showed up for them. I'm a different person. The same God who showed up for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who came into the fire with him, is the God who is, the God who am, the God who does not change, the God that David is talking about throughout this whole song. He's that same God. He hasn't diminished at all. The same God who led Moses through the desert he gave him strength and met all of his needs is the same God that is taking you through the desert that you're going through right now. The same God who was with Paul in prison is the same God who's in your prison right now, whatever that might be. And the same God who raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of those of us who believe in him. This is remarkable. Verse 14 of Psalm 145 says, The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. This is our God. 15 words. 15 words, and no matter where you are, if you're in a, in a storm, coming out of a storm, or going into a storm, I don't care. These are words that are for you. We cling to that Lord. We cling to Him. We believe in Him. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter, 5, chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose so if this is what these verses tell us about God let's ask the next question that we've been asking every week how should we respond to what these verses do tell us about God just two words not two points just one point but two words trust God if God is holding us, if God is, is raising us up, we can trust Him. Now, let me just tell you something. Two words, trust God, easy to say, hard at times to do. I, I was telling Pastor Steve before I, I preached this that, you know, um, this is one of those sermons I don't know if anybody else is going to get anything out of, but I know I have gotten a lot out of this. Because I need to climb up in my father's lap. I need to understand that this God who is abounding in steadfast love for us is trustworthy. And I need to remind myself as I go through the stresses of life like you do that I can climb up in his lap and remembering that image of a child resting in his mother's arms, I can... Whew, Trust Him. 
I can relax. I can let him do the heavy lifting and I can rest in peace. That is our God. So, if you're a believer this morning, I hope that you're encouraged by this. That whatever you're walking through, I want to encourage you to run to your, your Father. Get into the Word. I, I know we know what's going on. We watch the news and everything. But this, is, this is the stuff that lasts. Pray and trust. And this morning, if you are not a follower of Jesus, not a believer, let me just tell you something. The God who says that, that he holds us is the same God who wants to save you. You are separated from God because of your sin. That's what the Bible tells us. We're all falling. Matter of fact, in Romans 3.23, it says, All have sinned and fall. What's that mean? We're falling away. We start life here and we sin and we just keep on falling further and further away from God. But the beautiful thing about the message of the gospel, the beautiful thing about the message of scripture is that Jesus died to pay for your sin and mine. Oh, instead of running from him, stop, stop running. Confess your sin, repent, turn around and trust Christ as Lord and Savior. He wants to give you forgiveness of sin and He wants to walk with you through the challenges of your life, the dark times, the hard times as well, just as He promised in Psalm 145. Will you pray with me right now? And as we begin to pray, I just again, if that's you this morning, you've never trusted Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to just invite Him into your life, to have Him reach down and pick up the sin and carry the sin away and in place bring back and cover you with righteousness as God sees you so I just want to invite you to pray this prayer with me just wherever you are in the quietness of your mind Lord Jesus I believe I confess my sin I I believe Jesus that you died on the cross for my sin and rose I trust you as Lord I want you to be in charge of my life and help me to live for you. And Lord, for, for all of us who are, are, are believers, one of the things that the Word says is that when we go through, when we become Christians, we don't stop going through hard times. We will continue to go through difficult times. But the difference is we don't do it alone. The difference is we don't do it without hope because our Lord is with us. And I just thank you for that powerful image that we read of today of a child resting in a parent's arm. And we pray that that would be true of us in whatever, whatever challenge or difficulty we may have. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for watching Hessel Online. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can stay up to date on the latest content and also share it with a friend. And if you've been blessed by our ministry and want to support us financially, you can give through our app or, or click on the link in the description below. I want to thank you again for watching and God bless you.